Well, I'm, gl- I'm glad we have this time to be together going through chapter 19 of John. Chapter 19 is uh, what some would say is the low point. Um, people of faith would say it's one of the high points. It's the, it's the story of the crucifixion. There's a lot in this chapter uh, that we could talk about. Um, I'm going to do my best to get through most of it. But as I was preparing for this, I thought of the old saying that you don't need to put butter on a donut. Some things are good enough just as they are. You don't need to pretty them up, don't need to make it more palatable, you don't need to do anything to it, just let it be. Uh, And so I'm not going to try to make John 19 say anything creative or try to get creative with it. I just want to lay it out there. Um, if you've ever been with someone as they took their last breath, you know what a sacred moment that is. And this was the Apostle John at the foot of the cross. In this sacred moment with Jesus. He's the only apostle there, but with him are four strong, faithful women. The early church saw a parallel between the events of the crucifixion and the history that's recorded in Genesis 22 of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac on what was known as Mount Moriah. And the early church understood the parallel. The early church understood the shadow. We don't so much. But to understand God's hand in all this, I want to draw some attention to what the early church understood. In the story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac, God said to Abraham as the father, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Those are the same words that the father spoke over Jesus, both at his baptism and the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son, whom I love. There is so much similarity between the sacrifice of Isaac by Father Abraham and the sacrifice of the Son of God by the Father. God made a point to tell Abraham, your only son. Jesus was the only begotten son of the Father. When the Bible says in Genesis 22 that God said, take your son... And the Bible calls him a lad or a youth. It's the same word in Hebrew that's used of a man in his early 30s, which is how old Jesus was when he was sacrificed and on the cross. When he sacrificed himself on the cross. It, it's not as though this child, Isaac, was a little 12-year-old boy that could not <clears throat> have something to say about it any more than Jesus could have had something to say about it, but he subjected himself to the will of the Father as this grown man Isaac did to his father. The Bible tells us in Genesis 22 that the son carried the wood for the sacrifice, just as Jesus carried the wood to the place of sacrifice on the cross. The Bible tells us in Genesis 22 that the father, Abraham, carried the knife and the fire. Those were the elements of judgment. And the father on the wood of the cross that the son carried leveled the judgment upon his son. The Bible says that all this happened in Genesis 22 with Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. That's the Old Testament word for Calvary where Jesus was crucified, it happened at the exact same place where the father took his son, his only son, whom he loved, whose son carried the wood to the place of the sacrifice, whose father leveled the elements of of, of judgment upon his son. Same place where Jesus was crucified. 
The interesting thing is that the Bible says in Genesis 22 that when God gave the command to Abraham to sacrifice his son, at that moment, Abraham considered him dead. The day that God intervened in Abraham's and stayed the hand and gave him back his son was three days later. On the third day, his son came back to life, which is the story of the resurrection. The prophecy in Genesis 22, when God stayed the hand of Abraham, the prophecy was that God would provide the lamb and here at Calvary, and Jesus was the lamb of God being provided to take away the sin of the world. I mean, God had set all of this up from the beginning. He he had foreshadowed what was to come time after time after time, some in pretty blatant visuals. The, 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 the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus can be seen clearly way back in the beginning in Genesis 22. You know what that tells me? That tells me that God never says oops. Never does God say, uh-oh, God never says oops. Some of you feel as though life has been one oops after another oops after another oops. And you need to know that if God brought you to it, God will bring you through it. God doesn't say oops. For some of you, that's the only message you need to hear this morning. Because you look at life and you look at the things that have conspired in life and all you can say is, oops. Oops is not in God's vocabulary. In other words, it's not a kosher word. And all of this has been on display in Genesis, from Genesis 22 all the way to John 19 now. And so if you have a Bible, you brought one with me, got one on your smart device, it's on our app, it'll be on the screen. John 19, 1. I'm just going to take this little bit by little bit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. That's what verse 1 says. Now, one of the things I love about the writers of the gospel, and John in particular, is they don't, they don't have to make things emotional. They don't, they don't pretty things up. They don't embellish. They just tell it. John could, John could go into this long exposition about the flog and how brutal, and he doesn't do any of that. He just says they had him flogged. Part of the reason is because his readers understood what that meant. We don't. But I appreciate the fact that John, he doesn't try to embellish it. He doesn't try to make it creative. He doesn't try to do anything to it because he knows that when one comes in contact with the word of God by the spirit of God, it's going to be transformative. That's why he wrote the gospel. He said, I wrote these things so that you may believe because he knows the truth of the gospel is transformational. And so his statement is they had him flogged. I want us to understand what that meant. Jesus knew that his hour had now come. After being betrayed, after being denied, after everybody leaving him, after six illegal, unjust trials, he was flogged. Now the flogging that that, that took place at the hands of Romans consisted of a whip of seven or nine strands of leather woven into those strands, pieces of sharp metal of some sort or bone, and some on the end of them had a lead ball that was woven into it. And they were designed to tear away at the flesh and muscle of the human torso and legs. There were three different levels of flogging that the Romans had instituted. And, and I don't speak Latin, so let me try to get these right. The first, the level one was fustigatio, 
which caused a great deal of pain, and it was, it was pretty brutal, but it was a way for the Roman uh, soldier, the government, to say, hey, we know what you did, and you're guilty, but we're going to let you off. You're going to be hurting for a while, but we're going to let you off. That was level one. Level two was flagell- flagelletio. And that was for serious crimes and brutal crimes. And it was, it, it, they weren't going to let you off. They're going to make you suffer. And, but they weren't going to kill you. It, it wouldn't cause death. But you'll probably be in ICU for a little bit. That was level two. And level three was verberatio. This was the third level of a flogging. And this was reserved for capital crimes. It was always in association with crucifixions. And it had a twofold purpose. One was to force a confession like, we're going to make you confess. It will be so bad that you will confess. And the second thing it was designed to do is to weaken the body enough in leading up to crucifixion. It was almost in their way, as weird as it sounds, a merciful act so that you wouldn't last so long on the cross. Because without this beating, people could last up to six days on a cross. So with this beating, sometimes it still lasted three or four. And so it's this beating that Jesus received, the worst of it, the verberateo. And as part of the flogging, this level of it, they would stress out the prisoners either in front of them or above them. So the torso, arms, torso, legs are completely bare. And the whip used in flogging, there would be two soldiers, and they would whip it around the, the, the man's torso, and these bone and metal sharp shards would drive into the skin, and the lead balls would cause contusions. And once it was in the skin, each soldier would rip it out. And this would happen over and over and over. Confess, 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 confess. Eusebius, the historian, writes of floggings by Roman hands that oftentimes the skin and the muscles would be torn in ribbons and shreds, so much so that it was often that the bones of the rib cage, sternum, spine, were as exposed along with the internal organs. Many people died of the flogging before they ever got to crucifixion. And I look at that and I think, what we learned last week, Jesus wasn't a victim. He was a volunteer. Like he volunteered for this. Have any of you ever said you want to be like Jesus? The cost of discipleship is high. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they clothed him in a purple robe. That crown of thorns was not a little tear that would go around the circumference of the head. It was was an actual skull cap that covered the entire head area. And these Roman Roman soldiers would get on leather gloves and would twist together thorns uh, from that area that were anywhere from an inch to three inches long and quite literally as hard as, as nails. And they would craft this skull cap together and they would set it on his head and take a rod and to drive it down into the skull. And these thorns would be driven down between the flesh and the bone, down into the ear canals, into the eye sockets, into the nasal passage, all around the head. And from everything we know, Jesus wore that crown throughout the entire course of the crucifixion. You 
it's interesting to me that they would choose a crown of thorns. Primarily because of what we know in Genesis 3.18. Because of the sin of humanity, the curse of sin infected not just humans, but all the created order, including earth itself. And because of the curse of sin, the Bible says the earth will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. Thorns have always been a sign of the curse of sin. And now, the sinless Lamb of God bore the symbol of the curse of sin on his head as his crowning achievement. Bearing the curse of sin for me and you. The fact that they put a purple robe on him was doubly evil. One, purple was the sign of royalty, and it was very hard to come by. And they got a robe out of the one of the soldiers or uh, higher ups' closet and threw it on him as mockery because he claimed to be the king. But it served another purpose as well, because as the as the torso is shredded, as the organs and bones are exposed, the body goes through the process that God created in his body to try to heal itself, and the blood starts to coagulate and tries to tries to stop the bleeding, and this robe would serve that purpose as well. But imagine what happens when they get to the place of crucifixion and have to tear that robe off. Everything ripped open again. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. This was a game, a very sadistic game played by very sadistic men. They were soldiers that were just waiting for a fight. They were waiting for a battle. They were trained. They were hardcore battle-hardened soldiers. And they sit around in, in, in the holy city, bored out of their minds, waiting for someone to step out of line. So when someone does, all of this vehement like, aggression is thrown on this individual They've already done all of this to Jesus. And then out of mockery, and we know this from Luke 22, they first blindfold him. And I, there were four soldiers at the, cruci- at the cross. I don't know how many were a part of this. But they would stand around him blindfolded. Go ahead, who was it that hit you? Now we know from scripture also prophesied by the prophet that his, his full beard was ripped out of his face. And over and over and over. But he won a victim. Because he was a volunteer. Pilate in verse 4. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests And the officials saw him. They shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. And the Jews insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Pilate tried to let him go. He said, I, I got no reason for any, not even a misdemeanor. Like he didn't even have a parking ticket. And you want to kill him? And when Pilate brings him out and says, here is this man, what he's literally saying is here is this poor creature. As far as I'm concerned, he is completely innocent. 
and look at what I've done to him. It affirms what was prophesied about Jesus in Isaiah 52 about this very event, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. It means you couldn't even tell he was a human man. He looked like a slab of beef. And so Pilate says, look at this poor creature. You want me to do what? He's innocent. And the Jewish leaders cried out, crucify him. Do you remember why the Bible says that they wanted him crucified? Do you remember why it says? Why? Why? Because he claimed to be the son of God. I get so sick and tired of some well-meaning ignorant teachers or Christians who say that Jesus was killed because he loved greatly. Bogus. He was not killed because he loved people. He was not killed because he was the friend of sinners. He was not killed because he accepted everybody. That's not why he was crucified. The reason he was crucified is because he claimed to be the son of God, deity. And as deity, he demands allegiance. Let's not forget what led him to the cross, that he claimed to be your God. Love people all you want, absolutely. But Jesus didn't just claim to be a lover of people. He claimed to be God. And as God demands allegiance. Do you understand? When Pilate heard this, verse 8, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where are you from, he asked Jesus. You know why he was afraid? Because Pilate had a Roman worldview. And the Roman worldview at that time said this, that a man of importance, a person of importance, could be a representative of a god. The Jews just claimed that Jesus said he was the son of God. So now Pilate's thinking, oh, what have I done? Because if he really is a representative of, the, of, of, of a God, look what I've just done to him. And so he goes back to Jesus and he says, where are you? Because if I know where you're from, I'll know who you are. This is the question for me and you. Do you know where he's from? Philippians 2 says that he left heaven to come to earth to take the form of a human, the, 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 the form of a servant. He's from heaven because he is God. Do you understand that? Yeah. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish teachers kept shouting, If you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. Pilate was the governor of the local area. Caesar was the king. And Pilate was on thin ice with Caesar. So when they make this not so veiled threat, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar, Pilate was stuck. Because he's already on thin ice for three reasons. I won't tell you all three, but I'll tell you one. When Pilate showed up as the governor of this area, he showed up with big standards, big flags, with the bust or the visage of Caesar on top of him. Well, the Jews in the area revolted. They rebelled because they believe you have no other image of God. You have no image of God, and you don't bow before any image of any king. 
So for them to put, for Pilate to put Caesar up there as, as a God, they're like, no, no, we're, we're revolting. And so they revolted. And so Pilate rounded them all up in the amphitheater at Caesarea by the sea. Sean and I have been there. It's a beautiful place. We actually, when we were there, just a side note, there was a, 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 an American university that was doing an excavation. And they dug up all this pottery. And we're looking at all this pottery from this time. And he gave us some of them, and I snuck them back to the States. I have them at home. It's fantastic. If you heard me say that online, I'm kidding. I don't have it, really. And, 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 so, and so Pilate rounds up all these, all these Jews and says, unless you stop this revolt, these soldiers around you will cut off your head. And these Jewish leaders pulled their shirts down, laid on the ground, and said, cut right here. And Pilate was amazed. He thought, who does this? And so he was stuck. Do I slaughter, behead all these people or back off? So he backed off, which made he and Caesar look really weak. And so he's on really, really, really thin ice with Caesar. And so he's afraid of Caesar. He's afraid of the Jews. And so verse 13, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down at the judge's seat at the place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? And here's their nail in the coffin. We have no king but Caesar. So Pilate handed him over to be crucified. Did you know that crowd pressure will make you do stupid things? Listen to those words. We have no king but Caesar. They traded Jesus for a tyrant. which is what we do every time we choose sin over Christ. We trade in Jesus for a tyrant, the tyrant of sin that we think is going to be enjoyable, that in our estimation is the thing to do, and it's a tyrant that will steal your life and destroy you. And we make that same statement every time we choose sin over Christ. We have no king but Caesar. Don't trade Jesus for a tyrant. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Verse 17, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha, here they crucified him with him, two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. The Hebrew word for the place of the skull is Golgotha. The Greek word is cranion. And the Latin word is calvarium. It's calvary. The place of the skull where Jesus was crucified. And if you look at that place even today, it looks like a skull. So it was called the place of the skull. You can see in the picture maybe two, what looks like two little eyes. And Sean, I have been there. It's eerie. And did you notice, did you remember the, the position of Jesus? There's three crosses. There's one on each side of Jesus. So that means Jesus is where? In the middle. That's significant. Because any time that multiple people were crucified by the Romans, the worst of them is in the middle. So Jesus is taking the position of the worst of the worst. You can't get worse than the one in the middle. Now the Romans had planned on three crucifixions that day. Who should have been in the middle? We learned last week it should have been Barabbas. And here comes Jesus. Jesus. 
not as a victim, but as a volunteer to take the place of the worst of the worst so that because of the position Jesus has taken, the worst of the worst can have life. So if you've ever felt as though at some point in your life you were just the worst of the worst, no, you're not. Jesus has that spot. He he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So in a moment we move from the worst to the righteousness of God because Jesus has taken the spot of the worst of the worst. Oh, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Verse 19, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. The Greek rendering of that sentences, the, the, the Jewish leaders kept protesting over and over and over, don't, no, no, no. And Pilate definitively declares, what I have written, I have written, it is done. It's a settled fact. And here's the importance of why it was written in three languages. God was saying something. It was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. Aramaic is another word for Hebrew, which was the language of religion. Latin, the, the language of Rome, was the language of law. And Greek was the language of the culture. What God is saying is it is a subtle fact that he is the king of kings over all things, religious, law, and culture, over every aspect that your life can touch. He is the king over all of it. That's what God is saying here. When the soldiers, verse 23, crucified Jesus, he took his clothes, dividing them amongst, uh, into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. There were four soldiers at the cross, and five pieces of clothes in the, for a Jewish man. There was the inner tunic and the outer tunic or coat. Uh, and there was a, a belt, a headpiece, and shoes. And so there were four soldiers. They divided those four up. And they just happened to be left the inner tunic that was uncalled for. And so they cast lost to see. They were so unaware of what God had declared from the beginning. Hundreds of years prior, David prophesied this very thing in Psalm 22, that they would cast lots for his clothes. I I, I look at this, and everywhere I see, I see the fact that God never says, oops. God never says, what has happened? God led him to it, and God would lead him through it. Same with you. God has never said oops over your life. And Jesus trusted that enough to go into it, not as a victim, but as a volunteer. When the Bible says they crucified him again, John doesn't need to explain what that is because his readers understood it. We don't. Verse 
They crucified after he had been beaten, after the crown of thorns, after the flogging. The piece of wood Jesus carried was the top part of the cross, and it probably weighed about 100 pounds. And he carried it to the place where he had crucified and laid him down on the ground and took a railroad spike. And in crucifixion, they would put the spike through these two bones right here at the base of the wrist. And in this time, everything that was from the base of the wrist up was considered the hand. So when it says they pierced his hand, it wasn't here in the palm. It was right here. And when this would be pierced with that spike, it would cause the hand to force down and the thumb to force in, causing this, this, this nerve that runs through the forearm and the bicep into the chest, excruciating, paralyzing pain. And then they would stretch this one out and do the same. And the Bible says that the nail in his feet was placed in his feet, and it was either on each side of the post or stacked like this. And the Bible says in this position, as the body hangs on two nails and stands on one nail, that the body sags. And as the body sags, the bones, start, the joints start to pop out of place. The Bible says all of his bones or joints were displaced. His post-crucifixion body, his arms were about six inches longer than what they were because everything was out of joint. And on the cross, in order to breathe, you have to pull up on the spikes in your wrists and push on the spike on your feet to be able to get a breath. But then the excruciating pain of hanging on spikes and standing on spikes would be unrelenting and he would sag and drop. And then the unrelenting pain to gain oxygen would force you to pull yourself back up to get another breath. And then that pain would be overwhelming and would cause you to drop. And he was a volunteer. Some people would last three to four days on the cross like that. There's one account of a man lasting six days. And the ways you died during crucifixion was suffocation because you just can't bear the pain anymore and the diaphragm collapses and you suffocate to death. Some is due to shock, some through dehydration. Imagine hanging on a tree like that for four days. Another way you died is from the, the pericardium around your heart would fill with fluid and it would be so much pressure on your heart that it would burst. Your heart would explode. And that's how Jesus died. And bodies usually were left on the cross so that the little critters could climb up the wood and feast on the flesh and birds could land and feast on the flesh. And I look at all this and I think, why? And then I remember, Jesus wasn't ever a victim. He was a volunteer. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The joy of returning to heaven with his father and the joy of me and you being there. He was a volunteer. I've got a couple more things. Can I just press a little bit more? Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, his disciple, or this disciple took her into his home. Four strong, faithful mighty women. Beautiful, strong, valiant women. Imagine Mary, his mother, watching her son go through all of this. Imagine what was going on in her heart. I 
I, I, I don't know, but I just imagine that at that moment, Mary understood what we read about in Luke 2. When she has her new baby boy and takes him to the temple for dedication, and she's so excited and proud and happy to hold her new baby boy, and she, in presenting him in the temple, runs into an old man named Simeon. And Simeon is the man who had been there for a decade after decade, praying and pleading with the Father that he would be alive to see the Messiah. And in walks Mary holding this little baby, and Simeon says, that is him. Can I hold him? And Mary figures, well, sure, I love my baby, please. And Simeon holds this little boy and prophesies. It says, Mary, your son will cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and the sword will pierce your heart. And I think at the foot of the cross, Mary realized the gravity of that prophecy. Can you imagine? At the foot of that cross was Mary Magdalene. This Mary was from the town of Magdala. And we know from history that that town was, was, was known for its grotesque prostitution. And we know from Scripture that Mary had seven demons cast out of her, a demonic woman of seven demons in a town renowned for prostitution. Can you imagine what this woman's life was like before Christ? The abuse the degradation, and then Jesus showed up. And Jesus heals her and makes all things new. Aren't you glad that God walks around with a great big eraser? And Mary understood that for the whom much is forgiven, there's much love. So she's at that cross because she knows how much this sinless Lamb of God has done for her. And I love the fact that Jesus says seven things from the cross. The first two of them are found in Luke 23. They're not in John 19. But the first thing Jesus says from the cross in Luke 23 is, Father, forgive them. The second thing Jesus says from the cross is to the thief next to him. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. The third thing he says we read in John 19, and it's addressing his mother taking care of her life on earth. And I look at that and I think, how amazing is it that this God who loves us so much would send his son and his son, such a volunteer, so concerned for us, that the first three things out of his mouth on the cross were taking care of other people. If I were on a cross, I'd have something to say. But his three, first three things he says is all about other people, taking care of other people. And honestly, his first three things are about the gospel. Forgive them. Your eternity is secure. And I'll take care of you on earth. That's the gospel. He says, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness. Today you're with me in paradise, eternally secure. Take care of her. I care about your life right now. You don't have to wait to get to heaven for me to care for you. I care for you right now. It's the gospel from the cross and the first words of Christ. I just, There are times when I read this stuff and I just get more and more amazed at Jesus. I just get more. Verse 28, later knowing that all was now completed. And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge on it, in it and put the sponge on the stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he received the drink, Jesus said, it's finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It's the second time that Jesus was offered a drink. The first time, he denied it. Because it was a, uh, it was a pain a painkiller, and it was a hallucinogenic, and he, he needed to feel the full weight of this. He needed to feel the full weight of separation from God. He needed to feel the full weight of our sin. He needed to feel the full weight of it, so he rejected it. But the second one that was offered, it was a 
it was a mixture of, of like really, really cheap, cheap wine, like think boxed wine. It was really, really bad stuff. And they dipped in the hyssop plant and lifted it up to yourself. And this was significant too, the hyssop plant. Because it was the hyssop plant that was used back in the Old Testament at the last of the plagues. Before Pharaoh let God's people go, it was the hyssop plant that was dipped and absorbed the blood that was put over the doorpost of the house that the death angel, seeing the blood applied by the hyssop plant, would pass over that. And now at the crucifixion, when the Lamb of God has shed his blood, it's the hyssop plant that offers again another role in this. Instead of applying the blood, enabling this blood to be shed and the announcement pronounced, it's finished. I I love the fact that John tells us knowing all had been completed. I want to die knowing that there's nothing left for me to do. Wouldn't that be great? to die knowing that you've done all that Christ has asked of you. It's all completed. I left nothing undone. No relationship, no sacrifice, no call. Nothing else had priority. That's how I want to die. And when that's the life, that life can say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I'm good. Jesus drank so he could utter those last words. And what we see in John, it is finished. That, that's the Greek word. You need to know this. That's the Greek word, tetelestai. And it literally means it is finished. He drank so he could pronounce tetelestai. That word is used in four different ways in this culture. It was used of a servant fulfilling the master's command. When the command would come down from the master to a servant, and the servant had completely fulfilled the task, he would say to the master, to tell us die. It's all done. It's also used when a priest would inspect the lamb for sacrifice, and finding the lamb without spot, without blemish, Ready for sacrifice, the perfect lamb, the priest would pronounce over the lamb to telestai. This is completed, ready for sacrifice. The third way it's used is an artist. And when they would look over the work of art and they would see this work of art is complete, there's nothing left to do. I'm amazed at the beauty of this work of art. They would say to telestai. The fourth way it was used was in merchants. When a deal would be struck and the one would pay the bill in full, that full bill paid would be pronounced tetelestai. And all four of those are in play here with Jesus. All four of them. The servant has done all that the master has required. The son has fulfilled the father's every will to tetelestai. The lamb has been inspected, spotless, without sin. He who knew no sin, to tell us die. The work of art of God, this reckless love, the image of God in flesh, the love of God in flesh, nothing to tell us die. The bill for our sin that had to be paid, paid in full, to tell us die. To tell us die. To try to add anything to your salvation is an insult to God. To tell us die. If you believe in Jesus for your salvation and have asked him into your life and yet you live with, well, I hope I make it one day, that's an insult to God. To tell us die. Because of to tell us why, we just get to simply enjoy God now, to relax and enjoy, because all the work has been done. Completely free now we are of religious obligation. Someone has said this, God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. 
When I take the full joy of my life, not on my accomplishment, not on who's around me, not on what I've done, not on my performance, not on anything about me, when I take my full satisfaction in life in him, that's when he's glorified to tell us die. Has that been your religious experience? That there's no effort anymore. There's no striving anymore. Has that been your reality? Because that is the reality of the cross, to tell us die. Isn't that what you want? Oh, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Come and find him. I want you to pray with me. There's nothing left to do but accept him and enjoy him. went through all this not as a victim but as a volunteer God has never said oops over your life there's nothing left to do because it has been finished but to enjoy him forever if you want that to be your story I would encourage you in this moment just simply say Jesus thank you for being considered guilty because of my guilt. Thank you that by your stripes I am healed. Thank you that you took the punishment on yourself that I deserve. Thank you that you made it to Telestai. I choose you and your work for me. I choose to rest and relax and enjoy what you finished for me. Today, I choose you. Father, I pray that nobody listening to my voice would walk away from a moment without accepting what you've done and finished on the cross through your son. I pray that they would find in you new life and a finished work of tetelestai and be able to not perform nor acquire just to enjoy this beautiful relationship with you. God, we confess that for you so loved that you gave to Telestai. We profess that the power of hell has been defeated and that we now walk in freedom of Telestai. Thank you that you so loved that Telestai has become reality. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. If you made some decision to follow Jesus, I want to know about it. You can tell me personally. You can write on a card. Fill out one of our forms. Stop by the Start Here booth. You got to tell somebody. (laughs) After what Jesus has gone through, is it too much to ask? To make it public? I also want to be able to give you a little that little booklet that I wrote just to help get you springboarded into some some foundational stuff about the Christian faith. So you can grow up in this faith. I love you. What's more important, Jesus loves you. Let's sing a little bit.